to take up too much of your time, but I want to talk about words on the move. And the essence of the matter is this. Because of the printed page and dictionaries, we have a sense of language as static. If your brain is on writing, it's impossible not to think of, for example, English as being something which is a certain way in some Empyrean realm and is abused by people who aren't quite doing it right, especially when they talk. You can't help but feel language that way, when really language is inherently changeable. It's a thing that's always changing. And if you understand that although language changes slowly, usually, it's something that's changeable, you find yourself listening to language around you with more joy than you do if you listen to language around you as something that people never quite do right. So that's what Words on the Move is about. Language changing. I know that what most people think is, well, of course, language is supposed to change. But I think that often we think of language change as being just a matter of there being new words for new things and slang. But it's more than that. So, we know that we're going to need new words for new things. If somebody invents a bassoon, there needs to be a word for it. But we don't know that other than the new words for new things, language is changing just like cloud patterns. So, for example, if you looked up in the sky and saw the same cloud pattern tomorrow as there is now, so there'd be something wrong. It's inherent to clouds to always be changing. Language is changeable in that same way. It's as if it's moved by wind. We know that words will come in from foreign languages, so language will change in that there's something called sushi. Sure. But the fact is, if you took a group of people who were speaking a language and for some reason put them in a cave and all of their needs were taken care of, but they had to stay in the cave and they couldn't come out for good 3,000 years and multiple generations lived in the dark in the cave. So nothing's happening, nobody's inventing any bassoons, there are no other cultures, who cares about the slang? If you brought people out of the cave 3,000 years later, they would be speaking a completely different language than when they went in because language is changeable. The sounds would change, meanings of words would change. That's what language is like. We know that slang and idioms happen, but it's harder to process that a dictionary page is a Polaroid snapshot. It's not what the language is any more than a Polaroid snapshot of a person is what they are. In getting this across, there are five ways that words change, which if you always keep in mind, makes it much more fun to listen to language happening around us. Basically, a word is something where if it stays the way it is forever, that's the exception. There are some words that stay basically unchanged over vast periods of time. <coughs> and, one, brother. And even then, there's change. But in general, the words that we know now are on their way to becoming very different kinds of words. You know that a word is going to change. The only question is what's going to happen to it. So, for one thing, first thing, creeping implications. Words' meanings are always changing because there are implications buzzing around what, at the time, is a word's core meaning. Those implications buzzing around have a way of becoming what the word actually means. So, for example, our word silly once meant blessed. Audition used to refer to hearing. If you think about it, it should. The idea of an audition being that you stand up on stage trying out for something, that came later. Lewd means unlearned in early documents. It's one of the things that makes Middle English hard to read. Lewd doesn't mean tacky in a sexual way. It just means that you don't know many things. Merry used to mean short. Meat meant food. Loaf meant bread. And so on. That's the way words are. Now, in some happy <coughs> Huda thunk it language sources, things like this are trotted out as if they're special when actually they're just normal. This is what happens to words. So imagine if there's a, a word blessed, and there, you know, there was. A word means blessed. Well, if you're blessed, then chances are you could be seen as innocent. That rings around the notion of being blessed. After a while, that word that meant blessed meant innocent. If you're innocent, well, then presumably you are a harmless 
person. And so after a while, that word comes to mean that. If you're harmless, one might suppose that you aren't very strong, and so you become weak. If you're weak, it might be that that weakness is located in the brain, and so you're kind of not right. And if you're not, you could be seen as kind of a silly billy. And next thing you know, if you are goofy, you're silly. So blessed came to mean silly step by step by step over hundreds of years. Nobody thought about it, but that's just how things go. The word for blessed started out as happy, which means that a word started out meaning happy and then became goofy. Very ordinary. Now, this is why this sort of thing matters. It, it sheds a different light on certain things. Increasingly these days, we're hearing from some quarters, and just some, that to understand Shakespeare live when you haven't read it before <coughs> is difficult to the point that you can't really say that you have understood the material. Now, it's often said that if people are British, somehow that makes it all different. <laughs> Not true. Or that it's about really careful acting. Yeah, partly. But still, if you haven't read King Lear and you go to it, you don't really follow. Why don't we start adjusting these texts, given that words' meanings change, and if we understand that, then we know that a lot of the time, words don't mean to us what they meant to Shakespeare. It's not that it's poetic, it's that time has passed. So, for example, Edmund in Lear, you know, often they have the actor sit down, this is supposed to be one of the better speeches, he says, why bastard, wherefore base, when my dimensions are as well compact, now even compact is odd, but you kind of let it go, and remember, this is live, this, my mind is generous and my shape is true as uh, generous, my mind is generous, why is he saying that his mind is generous, how is a mind generous, why is he praising himself in that way, actually, generous meant noble, in Shakespeare's time. It didn't mean magnanimous. So when Edmund says that, he's saying, my mind is noble. So Macbeth, um, this is from the play Macbeth. So besides, this Duncan hath borne his faculties so meek, what? But it keeps going. Hath been so clear in his great office, clear in his office, what? that his virtues will plead like angels, and now it gets good, because you can understand it, trumpet tongue uh -huh. against the deep damnation of his taking off. Off what? And then he just keeps on going. And then somebody tells you, well, you lack poetry. No, it's that Shakespeare meant different things. This is what those words meant. This Duncan hath borne authority, so meek, so hath borne his faculties, no, hath borne authority, so meek, hath been not so clear in his office, I've never been clear in my office, so pure in his great office that his virtues will plead like angels, trumpet tongue, against the deep damnation of his knocking off. So, this is something that was done by a gentleman named Conrad Spoke. The idea was to only replace the words that we really can't recover, whether we're British or poetic or not. He tries to keep the meter, and if you have this, as the speech, you can understand it. It's quite poetic. It's certainly not the language of the street. But Shakespeare is difficult not only because of the poetry, but because it's been a very long time and words' meanings are always changing. Creeping implications makes all of this clear. So it also means that logically there's no such thing as a community of speakers using a word wrong. It just doesn't make sense. And notice, I'm not saying it's wrong to judge people, language is diverse. That argument doesn't seem to work on the general public. It's that logically, there is no such thing as a community of speakers using a word wrong. If a representative number of people are using a word in a certain meaning, then the meaning has changed. Now, many people would say, but if a person can use a word any way they want to, then doesn't it interfere with clarity? That is a very reasonable objection, but there's an answer to it. People, not a person, use words in new ways. So meaning change is communal. It's not people going off in their different directions. No language has ever been recorded as going to the dogs. So creeping implications, the fact that a word is something that's always becoming something else, is something that all people should know who are taught anything about language because it makes life easier in many ways. Then, second way that words change is faces, the faces of English. And what I mean by that 
is that there is a kind of word that we're not taught about when we're taught about nouns and adjectives and the like. We're taught that these things aren't real language, but they are. All of these factors are as important in communicating as saying things like boy and walk and early. Now, there are four kinds of these markers. It's not really four, but I'm pretending that it's four because I wanted this acronym with the F and the A <laughs> and the C and the E. Factuality, acknowledgement, counter expectation, and easing. What do I mean by that? Well, for example, when you say really, now, our brains are on writing, and so we think that it's really. I'll say I didn't know that really came from real until I was about eight. It isn't even pronounced like real. It's really. It's R-I-L-L-Y. Really. And the way that we use it is not to say in actuality. If you say, I was tired. Really, I'm never going to do this again. I mean, really, why does he do this? Really, really, really. What that is, is something that human beings do to indicate sincerity, to indicate that we really mean something. That's part of talking like a human being rather than Siri. You need your <laughs> factuality. And this is where literally comes in. Boy, people are upset about this little word. <laughs> you hear about it all the time. People are using literally wrong. I have had people actually get red in the face about this. And really, it's just Really, it's just <laughs> not understanding about the faces. So apparently the problem with literally is that people are using it in opposite meanings. And so it's one thing to say, this is literally what he said. But then if somebody says, I was literally boiling to death, that's considered offensive because they weren't literally boiling to death because if they were, they wouldn't be there to talk about it. So people feel that this is an affront. Now, what one often hears, if radio show or something like that is somebody will say, well, you know, it's the way people are using literally lately. I'm hearing this lately. <laughs> well, I don't know what lately is because this is not new. Here is somebody saying something. He is a fortunate man to be introduced to such a party of fine women at his arrival. You can tell this is not lately. Yeah. It is literally to feed among the lilies. Yes, that was 1769. So you can find this kind of figurative usage of literally way before 1998 or whatever lately is. But people are upset. It's considered a civic issue that people are using this word to mean its opposite. But really, there are many words like that. And for some reason, it's like Ken Golden. Ken Golden was a guy who, in seventh grade, for no reason at all, everybody started picking on Ken. I mean, there were all sorts of reasons to pick on various other people. It could have been me. It was Ken Golden. And everybody just tortured that poor guy for about three years. It really wasn't fair. Literally, is Ken Golden. Because if you look at a word like fast, so you run fast, that's what we immediately think of. But you can also be fast asleep. And most people don't sleep rapidly. <laughs> and something can be stuck fast. So fast has these opposite meanings. And I don't think any of us lose any sleep over that. You can bolt something down or you can bolt out of a room. That has never made somebody call in and complain. If you, took, if you seed a watermelon, most people would not be inclined to put the seeds back in. You know that it's taking the seeds out. But if you seed the ground as a farmer, it would be counterproductive to take the seeds out. You want to keep them in there so that <laughs> they will grow. And nobody cares. It's called a contronym. Literally is a contronym. Acknowledgement. Acknowledgement markers. So, so much of what we say involves tracking the mental states of other people. Suppose somebody says, oh, we're totally going to get tickets. That doesn't mean we're going to get tickets in a total fashion. Why would anybody say that? We're going to complete the action of buying the tickets. Oh, we're totally going to get tickets. What we're totally going to get tickets means is there's some reason that we all know to think that we might not get the tickets or that it would be somehow inappropriate, that there's something tacky about the event, but we're going to get tickets anyway. He's totally going to call you. 
implies that there's some reason to think that he might not, but we know that he's going to call. That's what totally is. It's an acknowledgment marker. I have had people complain to me about totally. They say, well, it's not total. That's not the point. It's become an acknowledgment marker. I don't care about this. So then there is counter expectation. So we've got our factuality. We've got our acknowledgment. Counter expectation is a lot of why you say things. The reason that you take up somebody's time and say something is often because it's rather novel. It's against what you would expect. So for example, ask. What I mean by that is this. Suppose somebody said, oh, look, it's a gray ass squirrel instead of a gray squirrel. And you know, somebody might say that. And if they say, oh, look, it's a gray ass squirrel. You think, well, that person is mentioning that the squirrel is gray, and that person is also profane. How vulgar. It was better in the old days. But <laughs> you think about it. Gray ass doesn't just mean gray and somebody lacks cultivation. What it means is that I wouldn't expect the squirrels to be gray. A person who said, I saw a gray ass squirrel would be from wherever it is in the world where squirrels are black. I've been somewhere where the squirrels were black. I can't remember whether it was California or Finland. But if you're from one of those places and then you see a gray squirrel, then you would say, oh, it's a gray ass squirrel. So ass, which starts out <laughs> meaning something that sounds like that and is buttocks, that has come to be a marker of counter expectation of a kind, usually not derived from the word for ass, that you find in languages all over the world. LOL, BuzzFeed, you know, about every two weeks, has something about how LOL doesn't mean anything. And no, it doesn't mean something like actually or chair, but LOL is easing an awful lot of speech, an awful lot of what we do with our faces, what we do with our vocal tracks while we converse, is designed to indicate over and over again in an ongoing way that all is well, that everything is fine. The amount of vacuous laughing that we do in most conversation is shocking to watch. And yet, if a person doesn't do that kind of laughter, you're kind of afraid of them. It's part of being a human being. So this is an actual, this is from BuzzFeed, an actual depiction of, no, this wasn't a depiction. This is actually two people who were flirting. I like you. I'm pretty sure everyone else figured that out before you. Oh, I don't know. Just assuming. I wasn't sure if you did. Oh, but I guess I shouldn't assume. They charge me again, so it won't cancel for a while. Oh, oh yeah, they charge me again. What's... Nothing's funny. That's not, LOL is supposed to be laughing out loud. It doesn't mean that now, but many people think, well then what does it mean? It puts you at ease. All of this without the LOL wouldn't be flirtatious and would be a little bit in your face. So that's what LOL means. So it's the faces of English. Factuality markers like really, literally, believe me from our president-elect or acknowledgement, totally, you know, is another one. Counter expectation, actually is a counter expectation marker in actuality, or ass, and then LOL, or non-standard dialect. Many people are perplexed to be told that there's something called black English. Many black people are perplexed to be told, you speak an alternate dialect as if we were in Bavaria and talking about Bavarian German. A lot of it is because going into non-standard speech is often a way of this easing. It's a pragmatic, I'm going to use the word once, technique. We've got the creeping meanings. We've got the faces. Now then there's grammar. Where do the little bits come from? And what I mean by that is that another thing that happens to words is that they become bits of grammar. Because something like Lee the adverbial marker, or little words like can and must and ought and should, you can't just dig them up out of the ground. They have to come from somewhere. And what they come from is what started out as what we think of as word words. And so can came from the verb that meant no, and that same root became canny and cunning and couth. Ought, if you think about it, where did ought come from? It's a strange word. It seems in spelling, it looks like somebody punched it. And it's kind of a strange word to say. Oh, it's like a seal. Where did that come from? It originally meant owed. And if you think about it well, they owed to do it. They ought to do it. Lee came from like, slow like, slowly, 
Like originally meant body. So that's where these things come from. So for example, Richard III said, let us go. At no point in the play does he say that, but imagine if he did. <laughs> let us go. Richard, I forgot I put that. Richard Rogers, the composer, drinking martinis in 1950 somewhere on the Upper West Side, would have said, let's go. Now that started out as let us go, but when somebody says let's go, you don't think of it as meaning permit us to go. You're really using it as just a bit of grammar that summons people to do something. Let's go. You learn later that it's technically let us. Martian linguists would often hear, let's go, let's go. It's a prefix, let's go. Well, that came from let us. Very ordinary process. This is called grammaticalization by linguists. That sounds like a disease. But basically, words become these little bits of stuff. The little bits of stuff almost always started out as free words. So that's the third thing. So we say walked. Earlier, it was walk did. Not in English, in Proto-Germanic, but it's easier to get it across as if it was in English. That's almost certainly where that ed ending came from. And if you hear this grammar happening, then what is often classified as vulgar slang becomes fun. So for example, I'm all, why don't we do it tomorrow? And she's all, we're totally going to get tickets, etc. It's one thing to listen to the all and think, what is that bubblegum expression that these teens are using? All what? But actually, <laughs> if the language were allowed to do what it does, and we could just embrace the fact that it never stops moving, this all <coughs> could be the source of a new irregular verb. I've been waiting for it to happen. Because if you speak English, it can, you can feel kind of impoverished. You know, you're learning French or Spanish or Polish, and everything's irregular, and they just do it without a thought. And all we have is these boring, strong verbs and to be. I want more irregularity in my life. <laughs> and so imagine I'm all, you're all, he's all. If you move along, it's I maw, you raw, he, zaw, and so there would be this new verb of saying that was deliciously irregular. And so foreigners would have to learn ma, raw, zaw, and they'd mess it up and you could say no, no, just like we have trouble with French and the gender, etc. But no, everybody just rejects all because people who say it chew gum and smoke weed. Anyway, so um, then there's the fourth thing. Vowels are always moving around. At Five Minute Linguist, I used the analogy of chinchillas in a box, because a guy I knew once had chinchillas in a box. And they're always moving around. Another analogy would be just bees in a hive. That's how vowels work. So the vowels in any language are always moving. They never sit still. And so if you have bit, the next step on the chessboard is bet. And so you almost know. There's a chance that if there is an it in a language, some people are going to have it more like et in the same way. That person who says, let's just do it a little bet, a little bet. If they make a bet, it's more like a bat. And so, oh, we made a bat. We made a bat. And they're saying bet, but really, it sounds like at. If they said a bit of a bet, I'm sure we can all imagine this person, some of us are this person, you would say a bet of a bat instead of a bit of a bet. That's because of ordinary vowel change. So a linguist listens to that and thinks, oh, that's just the way it would be. Whereas another person might listen to it and think, I don't like that. <laughs> but it's just, it's the way it goes. The hot cot merger is something that's making it harder and harder to teach the first two classes of introduction to linguistics because people don't have all anymore. Every year it gets harder. And so one might be a person who says bot for bought. And so you sleep on a cot and you also caught a fish. Now, it's gotten to the point, I used to say if you have this merger, still, what do you say if a little kitten runs up your leg and goes meow? What would you say? 10 years ago, I could count on most of the class to say aw. And so I would say that's the aw sound. Just this year, I tried that, and almost all the class said, ah, because nobody has all. It's the bot, bot. It's perfectly ordinary, though, because all is that chest move away from ah, and the sounds are coming together. You almost could have known something like that would have happened. It also is a lot of the answer as to why spelling in English is bad. And so, why would made be spelled like that? 
I mean, that, it makes no blessed sense. It seems like somebody did it just to annoy us and make it difficult to teach people how to read. And no sane person, and people were sane in antiquity. Just because they weren't as clean doesn't mean that they didn't have logic. And so, for example, made. Who would spell it M-A-D-E? <coughs> Nobody would design that. It's that it really was pronounced made or something like it. Made becomes mad, it moves, chessboard, and then a becomes a. And so what was made, you have the sound dropping off of the end, which is quite common. Pretty soon it is made. That's a natural process and it's a lot of why our spelling system is such a disaster. And I found this book from 1885 where this very earnest gentleman is explaining how a Northeastern elite American should speak in order to be taken seriously. And the sorts of things that he advises are delightful because this shows that the Edith Wharton characters who we think of as so charming, so charming, would have sounded really odd to us. They're dead and so they can't show us. But these are the sorts of things you would have heard. And so I put together a bunch of these words with this you know, nonsense paragraph, but these are the things that this man says one should say to be taken seriously. One might compensate for celibacy by sampling a juicy nectarine or by a balcony seat, he's really big on balcony, you do not say balcony, a balcony seat and take in a melodrama. That would be better than making do with a canine, despicable, dishonest person. Despicable, canine. Not canine, canine, dishonest person seeking to isolate you. Certain things must take precedence over others. <laughs> my dear, you, you know this person will say, my dear. Try being a nomad, not nomad. He's really strict about that. That's how Edith Wharton characters would sound. You almost couldn't put that in a Scorsese movie like Age of Innocence because they would sound like idiots. But sounds are always changing. Here's another example. You rebel against something that makes you a rebel. You're not a rebel, you're a rebel. If something is outlawed, if you do it anyway, then you're an outlaw. This is something you never think about, but it's in the mind of any English speaker. That's the kind of grammar we have that doesn't get talked about. You can record something, and then you don't make a record, you make a record. So you have that backshift that makes a verb into a noun. The backshift is delicious because when we can hear people in the distant past, you find often that they haven't backshifted yet where we have. And so it answers the question that some people often ask, why do people in old movies sound funny? A lot of it is because of vowels moving around and the backshift. So for example, Eddie Cantor was a popular vaudevillian and singer, and he did radio, he did Broadway musicals. He was, imagine a less odd Pee Wee Herman. He was one of the most popular characters of his day. Some people are crazy and have seen all of his movies many times. And in one of them, in 1932, at the end, he says, I learned that from a boy scout. And you listen, you think, what is a boy scout? You know, it's, it's a boy scout, not a boy scout. Well, what it was, was that boy scouts were newer then. At first, it was, well, we're going to have the boy scouts. Then it becomes boy scout as it becomes a thing. Sunset Boulevard, um, a movie I highly recommend if you haven't seen it. It's one of those movies where even if black and white bores you, this one won't. William Holden, in the beginning, he's doing a voiceover, and he says, well, I was out of money, so I went to the nearest supermarket, and I bought a supermarket? No, supermarket, William. Why didn't they loop that? But it's because in 1950, it was a market that was super. They were newer. And so you went to that supermarket. It became supermarket because time has gone by. On the Dick Van Dyke show, um, a woman of a certain age in 1964 is talking about, well, I was sitting with my husband doing a crossword puzzle. And he said, and I thought to myself, what? And I played it back, crossword puzzle. And he, and I'm, no, crossword puzzle. There's no such thing as a crossword puzzle. But crossword puzzles were invented in the 20s. This woman was invented in 1896. And that means that she was young when crossword puzzles came in, and she kept saying it until the end of her life. I highly recommend watching a 1972 um, episode of Mary Tyler Moore. Um, I mentioned Roseanne the other day to an undergraduate, and it was as if I had said something about 
Beowulf. And so I had no idea and I thought, boy, I'm old. But Mary Tyler Moore is even older. And at one point, these are modern people. They're in bright colored clothes, it's in color. They go to discotheques, they make oblique references to premarital sex. This is a modern show. And they're at the top of a staircase and they're thinking, well, let's get some Chinese food. And then somebody else says, Chinese food, that's a good idea. You know, I don't think such and such has even had Chinese food. And you're thinking, why can't they talk? What is Chinese food? It's Chinese food. Not in 1972, it was new to have Chinese food. And so Mary Tyler Moore and Valerie Harper, God bless both of those people, are saying Chinese food. Now, I'll bet if you talk to them now, they would say, let's have Chinese, Chinese food. But the back shift hadn't happened. So finally, we get to the fifth thing. This is so uninteresting at first. I guarantee you that this will get better than this. Here you go, a black board. <clears throat> Got a board. Can you paint it black? Who, who would do that? But a black board. But then, there's a black board. And you've got the back shift, but there's more to it than that. A black board is that thing that now actually can be white, etc. It's a very specific thing. So two words come together and they make one. <coughs> Same thing, a blue bird is a bird that's blue. Then there's the specific bird called the bluebird. Now, in linguistics, I have always found this, which is called compounding, one of the dullest subjects in the world in itself. I remember learning about compounding. There were other people beside me who found it interesting. And I just thought, boy, that's uninteresting that one, one way that you get words is that two of them come together. Who cares? But it's actually kind of fun because not all of it is boring. So I have just slowed this down by talking about blackboard and bluebird. Okay, new words come from two of them coming together. Let's move on. But sometimes it's only clear from spelling how much that has happened. A cupboard is a cupboard. I mean, I didn't know that until I learned how to spell. I don't know what a cupboard would be. I don't think I know what a cupboard is, but it would not occur to me that it was a cupboard. You can only tell from spelling. Breakfast, break fast. No, it's breakfast. Break fast is something that happened. The sounds change, and so you have a new word that came from two. It gets better, though. There are ones where you really wouldn't know because it's not in the spelling. Daisy. So you're watching Downton Abbey. Daisy. You know, well, you're just, I'm going to go off into the world. So Daisy. <laughs> Where did that come from? It was a day's eye. I mean, if you're fond of the flower, you can see how somebody would have said, why, that be like the eye of the day. And so, day's eye. A sheriff is a shire reeve. And then you say that over and over again. Not only is that boring, but you get sheriff. Or, sometimes you really can't know unless you're a nerd. So, <laughs> barn. You would think that barn was one of the first hundred words, because barns are big and brown and square and they just sit there. Barn. You figure that's one root. Not really. It's a barley arn. An arn was a building and a sleep arn was a dormitory and a guest arn was a hotel and then you had a bear barley. Bear arn. Bear arn. Barn. 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 That's where barn came from. So we got there, and we thought we were going to have the room to ourselves, and it turned out that like a family had booked it already. <laughs> so we're standing there, and there were like grandparents and like grandkids and aunts and uncles all over the place. That's almost exactly what he said. That he left, he left the train. He wasn't hesitating. He wasn't hedging. He was overconfident and jolly, and you know, thrusting his hands into the air. What he was doing, if we wanted to go through it, was indicating factuality, indicating acknowledgement indicating counter expectation. If someone says, this is like the only way to make it work, it's polite, it's easing. Probably the person doesn't want to hear that. It's just like somebody saying, let's take our pill now, when they're not going to take the pill. You know, imagine a sort of <laughs> Angela Lansbury person saying, let's take our pill now. Well, why, why let's? Well, she's not going to take it. It's easing, same thing with like. I forget why that was important. The point is, there are many faces of like, and so there's a Germanic word, leek, it was pronounced. It had nothing to do with that surprisingly good vegetable. I've been getting into it lately. Anyway, a Germanic word, leek, and it meant body, 
And so it's done all these things. It drifted in meaning. Something that meant body is now the suffix hanging onto the end of things for one thing. And also is the like that that sweat, that sweat boy was using. It became a face marker. It became grammar. And so it became Lee. Or, and she was like, that's grammar as well. It changed in sound. So leak became like because of these sound changes that happened. And it communed with other words. A uh, like. Like-minded. And everybody just hates it. When really, every time I hear like, I think, God, what has happened to that root? All these changing things, the language is alive. It's a beautiful example. Like is like a bunch of daisies. I love hearing people using like all the time. Of course, not all the time. But I think it's a wonderful thing. Now, there's a new book out about language change. Um, it's red. Um, it's about $13 on Amazon. I forget the title, I don't remember who wrote it, but at the end, there is a cute passage that I enjoy. Um, he says, maybe some prefer their flowers pressed dry in books. There are those with affectionate feelings toward the inflatable doll and the corpse. Surely though, most of us seek life. Language lives. And what I meant by that is that language is always changing like clouds. We don't watch a parade and think, why don't those people stand still? It assumes, we assume they're gonna keep going. Language is a parade like that. Um, Lynn Truss, who for some reason was assigned to review the book in the Times, said that McWhorter urges you to jump into the play. At no point did I say anything about it being like a play or that people should be in the play, but that's not bad. Jump into the play. That I will start saying now. So our lesson is print is a Polaroid snapshot. Or for some of you, I'll just say print is a photograph. It is not the real thing. A word is not something that is. A word is something going on. It has been in every language ever spoken, and that's the way it shall always be. And that's because words are on the move. Thank you very much. <laughs>